And before we start, I think Kevin Flynn has his hand raised. No? Nope. Maybe that was a glitch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, it's 4 o'clock p.m. Uh, welcome to the November 1st Dr. Cog Board Work Session. I'm Wynne Shaw, Vice Chair of Dr. Cog and the Chair of today's Board Work Session. Uh, our meeting is now in order. The chair would like to welcome Wendy Padilla, trustee for the town of Frederick, a new member of our board. Welcome, Director Padilla. The first business in order is to open the period for public comment. Um, Melinda, do you see any hands raised for public comment? Uh, I do see a hand raise from uh, Director Steve Barr. Um, I'm going to go ahead and promote him really quick because that might be why he's raising his hand, but just okay. in case he has <laughs> Sounds just good. In case. <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, and I don't see his hand raised anymore, and I do not see any other hands raised by attendees. Great. Well, with no one here for public comment, we'll close the period for public comment. Uh, our next business in order is the summary of the June 7th, yes, June 7th board work session. Are there questions or changes? Hearing none, uh, the summary will be accepted as distributed. The next business in order is a discussion with the governor's office policy and legislative teams regarding the 2024 legislative session to be introduced by Executive Director Doug Rex. Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. And it's great to see everybody this evening. Um, we have joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to list from the governor's staff. Uh, let me see. I know Eleni. Angelitis will be joining us here shortly. Um, she, this is a, as you probably know, the governor's releasing his budget request today. So uh, I know they're doing a bunch of these 15 minute briefings on various components of that. And she's gotten hauled into one from four to 415. So she'll be here shortly, but in her stead, uh, we have Jared Hughes here, the deputy director for policy and research, Jonathan Moore, policy advisor to, the governor, to governor Polis and Nathan Lindquist. I think I saw Nathan on here as well. Um, and planner, land use planner over at CDOT. So I want to thank you all so very much. And I talked to Jared a little while ago, and um, we put up what we thought we would do before we get into the nuts and bolts related to the housing and transportation, uh, in uh, just the intersection of those those two um, investment categories is he's going to provide just a quick update on other budget investments um, uh, before we get into housing. So Jared, I'm just going to turn it to you and and uh, you're free to go. Yeah, thank you, Doug. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, this is this is my ploy at um, stalling us a moment um, before we get into kind of the the larger conversation around housing related investments. But I think um, Doug mentioned it, but um, Eleni Angelitas is our deputy legislative director and one of our key policy leads on a lot of this work, along with um, John and Nathan, who are both on the call. And so um, I think given she got pulled into a conversation actually with uh, um, some of your local government uh, colleagues, uh, CCI and CML and CCAT and CAST. Um, so they're having a conversation um, at the moment. And in the meantime, I was going to walk through some of the additional um, investments that we are making in fiscal year 24 25. Um, give me just one moment. I slides have done something strange here. There we go. Um, and as you'll notice, I am neither Governor Jared Polis nor uh, OSPB Director Mark Ferrandino, um, but this is our deck uh, that we've been using throughout the day. You can find it up on the OSPB website um, if you'd like to take another look. Um, and then additionally, kind of the budget schedule and all the details are now public um, as of this afternoon. I think kind of the top line here, you know, we've had an uh, interesting few years of budgeting. Um, I think if we could all think back to um, you know, the 
2020 um, legislative session and budget cycle. Um, obviously, everything shut down in March with, due to the pandemic. We had to cut about $2 billion out of our budget at that point in time. And then we saw really um, a historic influx of federal funds um, into states um, and into our communities. So the last few years, we've had a lot of one-time spending and a lot of investment opportunity that we simply do not have as we move forward. Um, I'm sure many of you have been talking about fiscal cliffs and all the kind of tough crunches that this creates um, across state and local governments. Um, but we are very much back in traditional um, Colorado budget years. Um, but I think as we kind of move through um, taking those investments that we've been able to make over the previous years and continuing to kind of strengthen those and push those forward, we are looking, continuing to look at housing related investments, um, supporting our schools and our educators. Um, uh, governor continues to have a focus on public safety and uh, making Colorado one of the top 10 safest states, um, as well as a continued focus on saving people money on health care, workforce and economics, um, and then really kind of good governance um, investments and in kind of our general fund reserve, as well as state employees. So starting off with kind of the education sector in our schools, um, one of the priorities uh, since the beginning of the administration and one of the priorities for many of the folks upstairs here uh, at the legislature has really been to um, eliminate or zero out the budget stabilization factor. So this year, um, we are able to put resources towards that to buy that down. Um, that will be a mix of state resources and federal funds. Um, and then in addition to that, we have accompanying resources going towards um, our uh, House Bill 22-1215 task force, which is really kind of looking at um, our Department of Education, a lot of the education programs that we have across the state, and looking at efficiencies and ways to streamline those processes. Um, so there's a placeholder in there to do a lot of that work. Um, it's a big deal for a lot of our kind of um, labor um, skilled trades, et cetera. Um, a lot of those are programs that kind of connect folks to um, community college or technical college degrees um, programs. Um, and then additionally, uh, some funding to support mill levy equalization. With regards to top 10 safest states, we've got about $40 million worth of um, crime prevention investments going forward. Um, this is really focused on prevention and community-based investments. So our Department, of, our Department of Public Safety really kind of leads that initiative. Um, and I think uh, if, if this is ever a topic you all really want to kind of dive into any further, I'm happy to connect you with one of the wonderful policy advisors we have on our team, uh, Brandon Davis, who leads a lot of this work. Um, I think you'll see kind of a specific focus on um, gun violence prevention, um, victims' rights, um, and victims' assistance resources. Um, federal government had had a lot of victims' assistance money that has gone offline um, this year, and so we're trying to fill that gap a little bit. Um, but I think, again, kind of uh, auto theft being kind of one of the um, additional priorities laid out there as well. When it comes to kind of the higher education workforce side of things, um, most of the investments there are looking at keeping tuition rates um, kind of relatively lower um, in line with inflation and making sure that we're kind of ensuring that experience or creating the opportunity for that experience in a more financially reasonable way. Um, the Colorado Opportunity Scholarship Initiative um, has been very successful um, and is very popular. And we are looking at kind of extending that and really trying to focus on um, our youth and individuals who are experiencing homelessness. Um, leaning towards kind of the workforce development side of things, I mentioned it a little bit with the 1215 task force, um, but a lot of the priorities of the governor um, and our Department of Labor and Employment and our Office of Future of Work is really moving more towards kind of skills-based hiring, work-based learning, um, and really kind of supporting apprenticeship models. Um, I think we obviously see and understand, you know, we all know the value of a traditional four-year degree and additional graduate degrees, but I think looking at kind of opportunities for workforce development that kind of occur outside of those traditional academic realms is something that we see as being responsive to industry um, and a lot of business needs out there. So this is really um, a, a key area for the governor um, now, and I um, certainly would expect it to be over the next um, three years that we have in our second term. With regards to healthcare and behavioral health. Um, so we've got 
about two hundred seventy two million dollars um, in corresponding provider rates, um, including our direct care workforce. Um, so really think back to kind of pandemic. Think about the impact in long term care settings, skilled nursing, assisted living, home and community, home and community based care. These are really kind of those providers, um, you know, CNAs, home health aides, et cetera. Um, as additionally, as many of you who might be um, Denver based, as Denver minimum wage increases, our Medicaid and payment rates have to increase to keep up with that. So you'll see that captured here, um, as well as just a kind of general overall um, across the state, across the board investments. Um, We've got just under $80 million going into um, really reducing our competency restoration wait list. That's really kind of at the intersection of our judicial and behavioral health systems. So um, that is an area that is remarkably complex um, and uh, relatively convoluted at the moment. But um, we are looking to make, you know, just shy of $80 million worth of investments to support our state mental institutions um, and open up beds so we can get people out of correctional settings and into settings where they really can receive the behavioral health care that they need. Um, I think one of the last things I really want to highlight here for this group, um, and I, I'm sure some of you have been involved in some of the conversations um, at least with Colorado counties, um, as well as uh, the Colorado Human Resources, um, Human Services Directors Association, CHASDA. But the high acuity youth investment we're looking to make this year, um, $30 million, really focusing on um, really kind of those young Coloradans that have the most complex behavioral health issues across the state. Um, these are investments that will support provider rates, um, support beds, um, and kind of those high acuity psychiatric residential treatment facilities, um, as well as uh, workforce development and kind of creating kind of a worker uh, trainer training academy um, with the Department of Human Services. So this one will have an accompanying legislative item, um, but I think this is something that we will um, want to keep really close with counties um, and Chazda on as essentially what's happened is um, because we've lacked the capacity and the resources to, to adequately provide these services, a lot of these kids have ended up in um, child welfare systems. Um, and that's not an appropriate space. It's not the appropriate role of human services directors. Um, it's just kind of complicating things. So looking to help support that move in a different direction. Um, additionally, you know, about $15 million of continued investment in our public health infrastructure. That would really be local public health agencies specifically um, and kind of flowing to them. As we look towards kind of our climate goals, um, I think we'll talk a little bit more once we get into the housing section about some of our climate goals and how all this intersects. Um, but I think one of the key priorities um, since the beginning of the administration has been achieving 100% renewable energy by 2040. Um, so we are kind of, this budget is less about making new investments in this space and more about kind of capitalizing on the opportunities administratively as well as the investments that we've been able to make um, over the last few years. And then when it comes to kind of that reality and the intersection of kind of air quality and water investments, um, you know, we continue to prioritize um, transit. I think we can talk more about that later as well, but zero fare for better air um, and then zero fare for youth or resources that we are gonna be setting aside or looking to set aside this year. Um, as well as investments in sustainable agricultural practices um, and um, continued investments, roughly about $90 million in uh, water-related infrastructure investments. Um, we've had historic um, severance tax um, increases, uh, revenue coming in, um, as well as some propositions, uh, sports betting funding. So we've got um, just over $90 million this year, and I believe next fiscal year we're projected to be in about 115, if I remember correctly. Um, and then I think, you know, wrapping up here, these are a few investments um, that might be of interest to folks, but, um, you know, about $40 million total funds, only about three and a half that are general funds support a summer EBT program for low-income families and youth um, over the summer when they're not available for those in-school programs. Um, and then continued preschool investments um, and just supporting families um, across the lifespan, um, really kind of a key goal. 
So don't need to spend too much time on responsible government. This one's relatively straightforward and mostly just accounting. Uh, it's more fun for my friends over in the budget office. Um, not too much exciting stuff going on here. But um, it's all necessary investments, things that we have to do. Um, and our current level of general fund reserve um, is, if I remember correctly, as high as it's ever been. So um, it's a relatively good space for us to be in. Um, but again, I think given all the federal funds that we have um, kind of off ramping, um, and then kind of all the general um, budget pressures that we experienced since we were here in Colorado back in a traditional year. Um, I know it's a lot of those numbers uh, look relatively large. Um, a lot of this is being done with tax credits. A lot of this is being done with kind of um, different accounting mechanisms that we've been able to do um, and we're projected and, you know, um, Tabor surplus years, I want to say for the next uh, four or five fiscal years. So um, much more to come there. Obviously, today is the first day um, of all this uh, going out. And I think as we kind of pick up conversations and stakeholding, um, all of you, I'm sure, will be engaged in a number of different ways. Um, and I think that kind of leads um, us to the real kind of focus of the conversation now that I ate up about 16 minutes of our time um, strategically and intentionally. Um, but uh, um, moving, I think, a little bit really to kind of, um, as uh, um, the chair kind of laid out the focus of the conversation, want to get together with you all and talk about um, a lot of our housing priorities. And I think, um, you know, John and Nathan are really um, kind of subject matter experts in this space. So happy to have them on to kind of help add nuance and color as we go. But <clears throat> I think obviously last year, kind of through our conversations, um, I think, you know, for better or for worse, we are landing in a spot where we feel, well, I would actually say much for better. Um, and kind of now we have an opportunity to be, I think, more intentional and accountable kind of in our overall process as we engage local governments, our MPOs, um, and just really partners across the state. I think, um, you know, personally, as I look kind of towards a lot of the planning and kind of the goals that we've laid out, I think that the role that um, MPOs play and the role that councils of governments play in the housing and obviously in the transit space for years and years and years and years. But I see that role only growing as we move forward, as we try to build out more interconnected kind of regional policies and regional problem solving. And I think that is why kind of, you know, most of my background is working with the Dr. Cog folks in the human services side of things. Um, so have always been kind of a, close partner to a lot of your um, area agency on aging folks um, over the years. And I think, but moving and thinking about some of those more traditional roles within the MPO, thinking about how can we better engage you all in your kind of planning processes. I know Dr. Cog has already started um, and then kind of just map path forward for continued engagement as we move into the 2024 session. So this is really the first conversation um, from my perspective, and I think from our office's perspective. So um, I think with that, um, I will maybe pass it to John and Nathan for maybe just another kind of um, quick introduction of themselves, a little bit of their background, and then we can kind of get into the overall meat of the presentation. Yeah, thanks, Derek. Um, so I know um, uh, I, I know uh, most of you or, or a handful of you, but I'm uh, John Moore, Policy Advisor in Governor's Office, work on uh, uh, land use, transportation, and environmental issues. Was also uh, formerly a city planner at City of Arvada for five years, so always enjoy these opportunities to talk to local government uh, folks and, and share knowledge here. We'll kick it over to Nathan. Hi, everybody. Nathan Lindquist. I'm a <clears throat> senior land use planner at CDOT, and for for these purposes, I'm kind of detailed to the the governor's office to help advise, and that's mostly due to my background at the local level. I was planning director. Assistant City Manager at the City of Rifle out on the West Slope for many years, and then uh, got this job at CDOT and, and moved moved over to Denver and got to know some of y'all last year through the legislative process. And really looking forward to working with you and and your staff and everyone uh, this year as well. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I think it does. Jared kind of mentioned we're we're looking to forward to starting this conversation again. We I know there was there were a lot of conversations last year around 213 and a lot of policies there. I think there were a lot of lessons learned and, and a lot of um 
just a, a lot of information shared throughout that. So really what we're wanting to do is, is talk to people ahead of next session, um, run through ideas and, and conversations that, that were held um, last session and really kind of present a, a bit of a framework of, of things that we've been looking at based on conversations from last session and also see where, um, where it makes sense to, to plug in your local knowledge and see what, what we can build on, make sure that we are helping to support actions that Dr. Cog is taking, that all of your local governments are taking um, to make sure that we're all hitting the same overall um, goal of, of more housing uh, uh, overall and more housing near transit. Thanks guys. Um, so I think uh, hopefully Eleni will hop on here and be able to kind of provide some color as we go forward, but it's possible she gets wrapped up um, even into further conversation. So I think to kind of maybe sprinkle in and build off what John was saying, I think looking back on last year and kind of the general process, I think one of the things that we very much kind of learned, and I think we probably all would appreciate is we really went back to the drawing board and really kind of wanted to hone in on kind of priorities and simplify things. Um, you know, I think as we went through kind of the 213 process last year, um, I think I don't need to kind of, I don't need to relive the kind of the collective uh, trauma of going through kind of the related, um, you know, the amendment processes and kind of reliving that and kind of the confusion that was ultimately developed throughout that overall process. I think in general, it was um, remarkably complicated and in a remarkably complicated environment, misinformation and confusion kind of run rampant. So I think we had to kind of go back to the drawing board and revisit, I think, what are kind of the core focus areas that we really want to drive towards. Um, when we kind of did that, we really kind of settled on the strategic growth narrative and strategic growth idea. And I think last year, ultimately, we really kind of organically moved into that strategic growth space. The core of this was always housing, um, but we couldn't, we realized that we couldn't really talk about housing without talking about transit or water or air quality or economic development. And I think economic development was even kind of one of the kind of late additions to the game, but, you know, because my, you know, my background is demography and like, that's what I love, but like in my great, like jobs and job openings are the number one indicator of in migration in a county in a region or in a state. So the more jobs we have, the more people we're gonna have. And the more people we have and the more jobs we have, the more houses we're going to need. So like, you can't talk about any of those things in an independent space. None of them exist or operate in a vacuum. So I think we kind of went back to the drawing board and um, you know, the governor issued an executive order um, a few months ago, really focusing on strategic growth because one of the other key things that we heard from local governments and external partners was, hey, you know, like you you already spend, you know, X amount of dollars every single year supporting housing and transportation, economic development and water resources and all these things. And how can we better align all of those things in a more intentional way? And I think that kind of um, reality was something we were always driving towards kind of um, kind of in our conversations, but never really had kind of, I think, the accountability parameters in place to really make that a reality. So what we did kind of through our executive order was really kind of ask our state agencies to look at the resources that they have, um, and the whether it's state funding, federal funding, et cetera. Um, and then we wanted to engage our local governments as well. So I think, you know, whether or not, um, you know, a lot of your member, other member government organizations, you know, CML, CCI, um, you know, CAST up in the ski towns um, and CCAT. Um, we've kind of asked for you all to kind of provide feedback through those mechanisms. And then we've also been um, wanting to work with our MPOs. So, you know, Dr. Cog, Pikes Peak really being um, kind of the other most largest and most developed MPO in the state, collecting feedback on what's working for you all and what is it. And how can we better own kind of our process improvement and getting things on a right track together? So um, that EO process is something that is happening concurrently with all of this. We tried to keep them somewhat separate, but naturally they're going to overlap in the strategic growth conversation. Um, the next bucket here really revolves around accessory dwelling units, um, of which many of uh, you know Dr. Cog's member governments um, have some degree of ADU um, allow allowance within kind of their regions and jurisdictions. Um, and then really this focus on transit-oriented communities. Um, 
and then also how you know Dr. Cobb frames it up as a uh, um, our urban centers, if you will. So housing in particular. Um, so again, this is a mix of tax credits. This is a mix of freeing up additional resources by moving certain things to tax credits. Um, but we are looking to make um, about $140 million worth available through this upcoming package. Um, that includes you know, $65 million um, to better support housing near transit. Um, that's uh, $30 million in tax credits and $35 million in infrastructure investments. Um, we're looking to set aside about $20 million uh, to help support with financing for ADU development. Um, we know very well that just allowing um, accessory dwelling units uh, within a jurisdiction doesn't mean that they're going to get built. Um, they're hard products to finance. There's not great products out there to help with financing. Um, and so this is an opportunity for us to kind of open that up and hopefully bring some people into that market um, if we can be successful and kind of play that card um, appropriately. Um, also looking at $16 million worth of tax credits I and mean, what we've uh, kind of labeled the space to create idea, um, which I think builds on I would say it builds on some of the successful Main Street revitalization programs that we've had um, through OEDIT and our Department of Local Affairs, um, but really focused on kind of place placemaking, um, community revitalization um, within the creative sector. And um, I think when it comes to kind of creating those kind of urban centers or key corridors or transit-oriented communities, whatever language we want to use, um, we see this as kind of being an important part of kind of that vibrant community. Uh, additionally, looking at about $10 million um, specifically set aside for technical assistance um, and kind of that strategic growth space and supporting planning and assessments to align housing needs and goals at the local and regional levels. So, for example, like we know that, you know, Dr. Cog, um, that you all are kind of working on some of your own regional planning. Um, and I think we know that many other jurisdictions have done regional planning in their own jurisdictional planning over the years. And so I think this is an opportunity for us to try and align a lot of those things and really have line of sight into what those goals are at the community level and better understand how we can support and help drive towards those goals. Um, and then I think, uh, John, I actually might let you talk a little bit about the historic preservation um, and adaptive reuse. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, these are some of the existing programs um, at the state for allowing um, uh, historic preservation tax credits around both uh, commercial uh, upgrades and residential. So part of this will be um, plusing up those existing programs and also be a little bit to allow for more adaptive reuse for some uh, commercial properties to uh, housing. That's one thing we've heard a little bit is that some of those historic properties have may have vacant uh, commercial tenants and space doesn't work out. So having the ability to um, utilize those for more uh, residential purposes, um, we, we've heard there's a lot of interest in that. Um, and then the short-term uh, tax fairness proposal, this is actually something that's um, kind of bubbling up um, through some of our interim committee work right now. It's not actually a governor's office-led initiative, but the kind of narrative there is when it comes to short-term rentals, um, there's not much parity um, or like intentional parity between an individual who might be kind of renting out um, a, a, a accessory dwelling unit or a second home that they own um, versus kind of a commercial operation. So this is really kind of um, trying to draw some equity and some parity between those two situations. Um, I imagine this is probably of interest um, to some local governments on this call. Um, I very much envision it being a hot topic, um, especially in our rural resort areas. With regards to priorities, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, we've, I mean, John, myself, Nathan, you know, we've worked closely with Dr. Cog over the years, um, for many years. And I think being aware of kind of the Metro Vision work um, and kind of the goals that you all have laid out kind of there, I think it's a lot of overlap, um, I think, in kind of the vision that we see. Um, and I think kind of in our strategic growth areas, you know, really focusing, again, on the intersection between housing, transit, water, climate, natural resources, supporting kind of our open spaces and working lands, um, really kind of trying to capture all of those things holistically. And all of those things aren't just housing, but housing is obviously an important dynamic. Um, and I think similarly, when we look at Metro Vision, 
um, you know, there's focus on our agricultural lands, there's focus on kind of climate and goals that you're driving towards that are much larger than just kind of the immediate functions that, you know, a traditional MPO would serve. And I think as we kind of move forward, um, you know, in 2024, but also in five years, 10 years, 15 years, it's like, what do our communities look like and what do our regions look like? And I think that's the type of visionary work that I think the folks, um, you know, Dr. Cog's staff are responsible for, and you all are lending kind of a hand and eyes and your minds towards. But I think as we look internally at kind of our strategic growth initiatives, we want to be kind of intentional about aligning that with the work that's happening at the regional and local levels. Um, I think that's a that's a priority that you're going to see um, very much so this year. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of explicitly call that out. Um, Nathan, John, anything else you want to add in there kind of around um, our strategic growth vision as well as kind of the uh, Metro Vision goals? I don't think so. I think you covered it all pretty well. A thumbs up from Nathan it means I'm doing all right. Um, so strategic growth specifically, um, maybe backing up a little bit. I think, um, like I said, this is really the first conversation we want to have kind of with your group. I think we're probably looking, um, I know I think there's a, if I remember things correctly, I think there's a full board meeting on the 15th. Um, we would also love the opportunity to kind of engage and talk with some of your staff um, about kind of the things that they're seeing. So Something to just keep in mind, we could talk more about that later, but um, when we think about kind of uh, our our package, you know, strategic growth is one of those components um, and really one of the key pieces. So this is that planning framework. This is kind of um, looking at comprehensive plans um, within the housing needs assessment world, understanding where we are um, and understanding where we're going. Um, again, I kind of mentioned, uh, um, you know, I am always, um, my, uh, demographics, like I said, is my background and kind of in my heart. So like, I love the idea of kind of planning and understanding where our population characteristics are and what's that going to look like in the next 10, 15, 20, 25 years. Um, I think that based on kind of our population buildup, we should have homes that cor that correspond to that. Um, I think in the aging space, you know, that's very much, um, we don't have many homes for people to downsize into, you know, my mom was looking for a duplex for months and months and months, never could find anything, ended up in an apartment. It's all fine, but, you know, we don't have the diverse kind of market of options out there that ultimately line up with kind of where our demographics are going. Um, so really trying to put kind of that evidence base um, and a planning supportive data out there. Um, and then I already talked about the executive order, so I don't need to kind of touch on that too much. Um, shifting in, well, actually, maybe I'll back up. Um, on strategic growth, um, John, Nathan, anything else you want to talk there about? Maybe comp plans or other details? Um, main thing just to say, I think, I, you know, a lot of the goal of this is to, again, support the work that Dr. Cog and, and other areas are doing in um, some of this housing planning um, space and particularly to, to Jerk's point as well on making sure there is consistent data and data validation across the area. Something that, that has come up in a lot of these conversations is as we want to make sure that communities are looking at these housing, housing needs assessments that we are getting kind of ground truth in the data so that it, there, there's been a little bit of a concern raised that if every, every community is doing this individually on their own, there is a scenario in which if you tally up all of the projected growth from every individual area of the state, it winds up being two or three times the amount of expected growth that the state demographer has. So making sure that as, as different communities and different regions are, are doing some of these planning efforts, that they're able to kind of cross-reference or, or validate some of that data across the state so that you know we, we have a, a more fine-tuned sense of where growth can happen um, uh, within these boundaries. But again, really, you know, I think we're, we're really interested in, in leaning and working with everyone on, to see where uh, the work that Dr. Cog is going in this area and, and use that as a, a bit of a model for uh, regional uh, collaboration across the state. Yeah, and I'll also add, um, I think the elements that were in here, comprehensive planning, housing plans, where overall last year, one of the parts of SB 213 that was more well-received across the board. Um, and so it was a great, that's one of the reasons we're bringing it back. But then also I think like one of the legitimate concerns last year from local governments was there were so many different parts of this that it was a lot of like analysis paralysis, I would say. And um, 
so figuring out how we can trim this down to make sure everyone's not having to do the same reporting and analysis over and over. And that's where I think working with you and working with your staff, getting the staff together with the, the advocates um, who would like to see a lot of this information. And a lot of it is really important, but figuring out how can we get the information so people are making the best decisions while not overdoing the amount of analysis and work to get there um, is, a, is an important part of this one going forward. Yeah, thanks guys. And um, I think uh, Doug, maybe Eleni is on or in, uh, she said she's, I think she's in the, maybe the participants. Whatever the holding space was that you have first, which is a nice filter in the grand scheme of things. I was like, I don't know what this is, but. Uh, I'm looking. Her, she's in there as uh, A-N-G-E-E-F. Oh, got it. <laughs> I'll promote her right now. Which she should really change her name. <laughs> she should be in. Eleni, are you with us? Okay, well, I'll keep moving here. Um, I think shifting a little bit to the accessory dwelling unit conversation, um, I don't need to kind of uh, explain to you what an ADU is. Uh, this is a nice graphic. I think it might be something we actually pulled. I've seen this in a number of AARP documents. It's probably relatively common, but um, I think, again, the, the goal with our ADU-specific work is we know that just having, like I said, like many... A lot of Dr. Cog jurisdictions allow ADUs in some capacity. Um, it doesn't mean adoption and the building of them is kind of um, proliferated. So we're looking at kind of innovative financing opportunities um, to kind of support that development, um, as well as um, standardizing permitting processes um, and kind of allowing for these to kind of be built with more ease. Um, again, I think coming from my background, um, I love kind of the aging in place opportunities um, love the idea of thinking about, you know, um, you know, this is relatively uh, a older adult aging specific um, perspective, but I think having a home, homes are one of the primary resources older adults have and the opportunity to bring in additional kind of resources um, through rent um, allows them to stay in communities longer, especially on the kind of heels of um, a lot of our property value increases over the years. Um, so I think this is just a, um, I would say a big step forward um, in kind of the overall package and probably the most um, significantly different component than um, what ultimately um, had been talked about previously. I think the the financing mechanisms uh, was just not something that we had seen. I think it's pretty creative and innovative. Um, Eleni or John, Nathan, others, anything to add there? Yeah, I think, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you so much for having us. And I apologize for being a little bit late. I was actually with um, some local governments for a budget briefing down in the carriage house. I'm in, at the governor's mansion. This is not my home, um, just so everybody knows. Um, I did just want to say that I think on this piece specifically, um, a big part of, you know, Representative Amable will be carrying this bill. And I think some of the questions that came up in a stakeholder meeting yesterday, and I think continued, is just around how do we allow for ADUs and complement existing policies at the local level as well? And then also really make sure that we're emphasizing, you know, there sometimes are infrastructure and other uh, restraints. And so I think as we continue to actually craft the language for that bill, uh, I think we're excited that there is this financing component. And as I think Jarrett mentioned, there's two pieces really specifically that I think we're really excited about. And one is really supporting local governments um, who can waive their fees for homeowners. And that could look like a, a whole host of different things. And I think that's another area where we need to have some more direct stakeholder work with special districts just around like what is possible and with local governments. And so one of, one of the components is the fee reduction grant program. So local governments would be eligible to receive some funding to waive their fees in exchange for it to be a long-term affordable unit. It's not an STR um, and so forth. And then the second piece as Jarrett mentioned, is really that innovative financing, because even if you have the policy reform side, if you're not solving for some of the um, financing, it's really tough, especially in this interest rate environment. You can't really expect a homeowner to want to refi when interest rates are this high or take out a HELOC. And so part of the financing that we're working on is 
two components. One is similar to the Renew program, which would be kind of a loan loss reserve fund that would hopefully be run out of Chaffa. And then the second piece is um, this CPACE type model. Um, so like a CPACE like property tax financing mechanism to allow homeowners to pay back in like 25, like 30 years um, through their property tax bills. We're still really trying to figure out what the CPACE part looks like. Um, but I think just on the, on the first part, that loan loss reserve uh, would be administered by Chapa, and they could also bring other private lenders to the to the table. So really excited about that being a little bit more of a robust approach, taking in a lot more considerations than I think um, last year's components for ADUs did. Um, yeah, maybe just like to talk a little bit more, make sure we cover the the geographic um, area of this too. Is, is mostly looking at um, urban municipalities within MPOs with over a thousand people. Um, most of those jurisdictions already allow ADUs um, by right or or administratively. Um, part of the piece is thinking through this is you know a lot of these communities do allow them uh, administratively, but have differing design standards and, and requirements there. Something that that we're exploring and I've, I've really heard a lot is that in order to allow things like modular ADUs or uh, to make this as simple as possible across a, a larger geographic region is trying to make sure those requirements kind of line up to create a market for really easy access to standard um, ADU models and standard ADU financing, um, even beyond what, what the state can support. And, and that's something that uh, several other states have um, also looked into. But overall, one of the biggest things that we've heard is that in order to in order for the market to create, and sorry if you guys can hear the, the fire engine going on in the background, I'm not sure how much that comes through on the, on the microphone, but um, uh, one of the, be the best ways to create um, easy to access financing methods for uh, ADUs is to have consistent standards across a large region so that um, those markets can kind of develop naturally throughout the state. There wouldn't be a meeting in this conference room if there wasn't a fire engine or ambulance outside. Um, this is no need to kind of do this out, but I think, you know, again, one of the things that, um, I've always appreciated through a lot of my work has just been kind of the partnership between AARP and American Planning Association over the years, I think bringing together kind of a lot of this work, um, in a relatively kind of nuanced way. Um, moving into kind of the transit working communities, um, conversation, I think, um, you know, this aligns, as I kind of pointed out previously, I think. But now we're talking about kind of these urban centers or neighborhood centers as we've kind of conceptualized them, looking at Metro Vision and a lot of the goals that I think you all have laid forward kind of for your own region. And then I think a lot of the goals that we see um, that we would love to drive towards the rest of the state, see this as being kind of one of those fundamental pieces that really addresses all of those intersectional issue areas that we spoke about earlier. Um, so I might let um, the rest of the team kind of chime in here, I think, um, to talk a little bit about the detail. Yeah, I, I'll turn it over to Nathan and John, but and I can speak to some of the housing focus components of, of our approach. And I wanted to just preface, I think this is really a starting place. And I know that we've said this to Doug and others. I think where we really want to go with this legislation is really creating a framework that everyone really can agree upon and making sure that you know we can build it over time instead of I think some of the approach of last year. I think what we really really can't emphasize enough is wanting to make sure that it does fit into a lot of what you all have been working on with your Metro Vision, and so really are looking for robust partnership there. Um, I don't know Nathan and John if you want to give kind of the highlights, and then I can speak to the affordable housing tax credit and some of the other components. Yeah, absolutely, um, and it, it, as. A like I said, this is really kind of an entryway into the conversation, but as, as an overarching goal, it, it, you know, transit and housing are linked in this space. You, you can't have a successful high-functioning transit system if you don't have a lot of people living near that transit. Um, so that, that's really the overarching goal with this policy that we're looking to, to pursue, is to make sure that there are ways um, that areas uh, within a half mile of transit stations are uh, able to reach um, zoning capacity goals to have that um, uh, supportive density um, around there. And then additionally to that, look towards these kind of neighborhood centers um, that may be just outside of, of transit areas, but um, have active commercial areas and, and have active um, that transit potential uh, that places can 
uh, look to create more of that support in the future. Yeah, as a as a kind of a framework, obviously, the way we're thinking that this works is locals self identifying and designating these areas that make sense. Um, and you've obviously obviously had this urban center system, so this would work a lot like that. And if you want to keep the urban center name as your program, and we can call it something else, that's fine too. But I I think we wanted to at least start out by highlighting. Um, it would kind of work in a similar way, and then we would all work together over the next couple of months to figure out wh what is the proper criteria for this designations that can meet all of our shared goals. Um, and then once once we know these things, and, and the hope is like a similar, as we were talking about earlier, aligning state, regional, and local resources, once we can kind of see the map of these areas where locals uh, would like to grow, it just helps everyone figure out how to align the resources so much better to have that done in a similar way at the at the state and regional levels. And then the neighborhood centers are kind of outside of the immediate, you know, high frequency transit network. And so that's more of something we're thinking is like, and, and again, this is so early for us, we haven't really sketched this out, but it's, a, it's more purely opt-in. Um, there's not transit there, but it's an area where locals are like, we need growth. This is a great spot to do it near a downtown or on an aging commercial corridor. Um, we want to designate this as an area that's eligible for state incentives, you know, state incentives, quotation marks to be determined. But that again ties back into what we're going on with the executive order process and trying to think through, well, how, how do different state agencies work together to support these things? Um, so I'll stop there. Got some nice pictures here. And then I think we'll turn to Elena. I, I think as Jarrett and, and the team mentioned, I think we're really just more focused, I think, on these housing opportunity goals. Um, and I think, again, trying to develop a policy that promotes both flexibility and accountability in meeting those goals. Um, I think the second piece that I think we're really, really, really excited about, I think, which speaks to, I think, a lot of the work that Dr. Cog will has been doing and will be doing through the housing needs assessment is, I think, really trying to identify in these transit areas where you do want to build more dense housing, what are those barriers? I know that one of the big barriers is around infrastructure funding. And so in the governor's budget that was released today, which I think Jared, I think they mentioned at the top of the call, but having this TOD infrastructure fund where it can be tied to some of these goals, in addition to a boost of our state affordable housing tax credit, which is our state version of LIHTC, which is one of our most effective tax credits in the housing space. Even the state auditor's report that came out a couple of years ago said it was one of our the most powerful tools that the state can have um, for more production of affordable housing. So we, we think that the TOD fund of 35 million and then conversations around it being ongoing and then the boost of the $30 million of the affordable housing tax credit. The affordable housing tax credit will really prioritize Chaffa already through their qualified allocation plan already prioritizes or gives preference points to more walkability, um, transit oriented development. But really the, the boost of the 30 million here is to kind of create a sub credit that really focuses on affordable housing using this tax credit in these transit areas. So we're really excited, I think, about more of a balanced approach of having that right amount of incentives, but also speaking to some of the funding that actually can help, um, which is a barrier in terms of affordability and then the infrastructure component that often gets overlooked with these types of developments. And so, you know, that really kind of leads us in kind of to the end of kind of the overall package presentation. I mean, again, I think um, these were just kind of items that we really pulled, um, honestly, from kind of reviewing Metro Vision, reviewing kind of Dr. Cog's work over the years, and thinking about kind of how that overlays with a lot of the vision, I think that we're trying to map out and move forward. Um, so, you know, I think obviously, as I've said multiple times, this is the first conversation what we hope Sorry. Um, first conversation, um, many, um, and 
realizing that, you know, I think where we are kind of in the process, um, I think Eleni obviously being kind of our key on um, all things legislative um, and driving a lot of those conversations, want to bring you all in um, as appropriate, engage with your staff um, if appropriate and open to that. Um, and really just figure out kind of how we kind of bring these things together, um, identify where there is daylight between us all, do what we can to close it. Um, but I think we look at kind of these key priorities, I see a lot of unity and a lot of vision that overlies with one another. Um, so, I mean, I think that really kind of leads mostly, I think, to just kind of a general conversation around next steps. Um, and I think I, I'll maybe stop here and let kind of um, Eleni and anyone else on the team provide any kind of wrap up comments. And then we can talk about um, just general things and what's up. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jarrett. I think, you know, part of the process of last year is that we didn't have, I think, some of the time in the fall to really go back and forth on more specifics around language um, and concepts, more room for ideas. And I think what we're really hoping to do in, in, in an effort of full transparency, so Representative Mobley, as I mentioned, is running the ADU bill. Um, Senator Roberts is going to be running this more strategic growth planning bill. I think that there's a lot of room in that bill, especially to add more components and more ideas. I know last year we had a lot of good conversations with CCI and other groups around, you know, more ideas that could be added into kind of that future planning and, and updates every year and making sure things are aligned with Prop 123. And then in terms of the transit-oriented um, communities bill, right now, Representative Woodrow and Representative Judah are working on that bill. However, we're still working really closely with Representative Lindstedt and Senator Winter on trying to figure out between the, their bill and this bill and what moves forward, what's complementary and so forth. And um, I know that I've had conversations with some of you on this call too. Of, you know, what are things that we want to put as a marker down for this year that we need just more analysis on? So for future years, we could come back um, and, and build upon this work and really getting back to kind of that framework um, piece. So I think a lot of room for a lot more discussion, more ideas, and we're hoping to, to have some language that we can be sharing out and really view you all as thought partners on how that language is written and how it complements the work that you are already doing. Thank you very much. Um, I wonder if there are some questions that some of our directors have. Uh, please feel free to raise your virtual hands. And um, here we go. Okay, uh, Director Odoricio first. All right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you know, I'm listening uh, to this and I'm looking at the bullet points that I wrote down uh, for planning and strategic. I think it's important to note that uh, I appreciate what what the governor's office brought up today, because what I'm hearing is that each city and county can go back. And what we're trying to do is encourage people to handle growth, to plan it, to think ahead about it. And whether you're in a jurisdiction, because some of the folks on this call have jurisdictions and have voters that are really anti-growth, right? And we have some folks that are a little bit more tolerant, but what we can do if we do this right, uh, I think the folks on this uh, could embrace this because it allows you to go back to those anti-growth folks and say, we are talking about how to manage it correctly, not just go open, open the floodgates. And that's a way that you can frame what is just good business practice for growth into something that your voters can appreciate. And if you're in a different uh, community that tolerates more growth, then they're going to still appreciate it. But I just think that's a win, uh, winning strategy there. And I really appreciate it. When it comes to ADUs, I love the fact that you guys are focusing on how to, instead of forcing ADUs in places that people don't want them, how do you embrace the fact that some of those, some of the jurisdictions that are willing to take on those ADUs and do it can actually get them done? And I think that's a huge jump in effectiveness from last year. And I, I just compliment you on that because I think you're going to get more ADUs in the state by doing it what the way you're doing it, by empowering and encouraging and providing resources. And then the other one I have to say I'm uh, confident about is when I hear about the uh, transit-oriented development, you listened to Dr. Cog. You listened. And that's what we asked for is to talk, to listen to us about our urban centers and how we do this work all day, every day. We do it in a regional uh, way. And so I just want to thank you because I really think this group needs to recognize that the work that Dr. Cog did in advocating, I want to compliment the members here, the directors, but also Eleni and her team. So thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah, oh, thank you, perfect. Commissioner. I was we were just holding up the Metro Vision plan we've got over here in case you <laughs> know what on earth we were doing. I it's now my coffee table book, just for what it's worth. I when I went to the Dr. Cog meeting a couple of months ago, I took it and it's sitting on my coffee table. <laughs> That's great. No, and I think it's important um that we make that differentiation also that Dr. Cog is kind of the library or the resource and not the enforcer. Um, so it gives us tools, um, great ideas, and um, allows us to examine opportunities. And so this is a great opportunity to hear your ideas and share that partnership. Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you to uh, the, uh, the state crew, the governor's office, and CDOT for being here and giving us this a great update, which is uh, a lot of a lot of meat for us to consider, and I really appreciate the approach that's being taken here. A couple of thoughts and suggestions going forward. Uh, number one, Denver through uh, our Blueprint Denver, which was a two and a half year process, three thousand unique individuals participating, approved in 2019, and in our existing uh, zoning code, our existing map uh, has entitlements already in place or aligned uh, for any map amendments that can handle the 50,000 units that we are said to be deficient uh, by 20, I think 2040. And, but they're very thoughtfully arranged so as to encourage them exactly where I saw this presentation uh, uh, saying that uh, in alignment with Metro Vision, you know, community corridors, urban centers, et cetera, really, really like that approach. So thank you for uh, for doing that. Uh, and secondly, uh, on ADUs, I know that there is a lot of talk about ADUs, and I'm not saying that everyone thinks they're uh, you know they're a great cure or they take care of the of the shortage. They don't. We know that. Uh, but there are a couple of things I'd like to uh, make sure you uh, you have on your radar. Number one is the cost. We have rezoned. We've done individual spot rezonings. We've done neighborhood wide rezonings to allow ADUs. Uh, of the spot rezonings, the single parcels, uh, I followed up with our assessor and discovered that I may have the numbers wrong, but let's say out of every 100 rezonings we've done to allow ADUs, only 10% of them ever got built. And a lot of that is when when the folks who did the rezoning uh, start talking to our contractors and then, God forbid, they start talking to our permitting office, they discover all the the, the web of very, very difficult hurdles, particularly, you know, water, sewer, uh, and, uh, and it's, uh, and one in particular, I have a fellow who built an ADU uh, detached in his backyard in the College View neighborhood. It's all finished, but the city will not give him a CO uh, or would not have given him a CO until he also widened his front sidewalk on Yale Avenue to our new standard of five feet from the four feet that existed. None of his neighbors already had the five foot sidewalk, and that's you know beside the point. But for him to do that, not only would have been the expense of adding that sidewalk, completely unrelated to the ADU, by the way, and the ability to live in it, uh, but he had an eight foot hedgerow, like a privacy hedgerow, right up along the sidewalk, and a very mature, decades old elm tree, all of which would have had to come out. It was probably going to be about a twenty five to thirty thousand dollar additional expense. Uh, we finally, we worked with the permitting office to waive that requirement, most likely only in light of our initiative 307, which we now have the city being responsible for building and repairing sidewalks citywide rather than the property owners. So uh, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is keep in mind uh, a way, it was on slide nine that I had this thought, uh, a way to, you know, in providing this assistance from the state level for ADUs, uh, think about adding a scoring uh, category for streamlined municipal uh, requirements in the permitting. And you know, like if, if Denver were to drop its requirement to uh, to build the new sidewalk standard as part of your backyard ADU, maybe if they waive that, uh, that could you know, give them a few more points on the scale. Um, and then the other, the last question I would give is uh, uh, in thinking about ADUs, our assessor had ran some numbers for me about a year and a half ago that showed that um, properties that sold within the prior two years 
uh, that had uh, detached ADUs sold for a median sales price of $900,000. And what this means in a neighborhood like College View or Brentwood or uh, Marley, and my apologize for my clock here, uh, yeah. it means that it could be a factor that leads to more displacement. It's not a one for one increase in obviously in property values for the next door properties, uh, but it does mean that when that property sells in the future, that the people who live in that uh, in that uh, underserved community, uh, none of them would be able to afford that property. So one by one, as this happens, the uh, the composition of the neighborhood begins to change, and that's a displacement concern that I would have. Uh, just keep that in mind. Is there any way to mitigate against that? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director Nermela. Hello, thank you. Um, I really appreciate uh, where uh, the state is going with respect to addressing our concerns. Um, I, I really, uh, looking at the TOCs, or I guess the transit oriented, what are they again? I wrote down TOCs, but now. Um, I, communities, thank you. Um, I, we have in Westminster, we already had several urban centers that we'd already started building out. And um, I think as we continue to move down this path of being able to self continue to self identify as a community where we want to grow, um, I would just encourage us to um, lay out parameters that do also reflect the variability of these areas. Some even when we have transit stops, we have existing communities in those areas that um, are right next to areas that could develop. And so it's not a one size fits all approach. So um, I definitely support getting more into the detail on how we'll actually play that out. Um, the other thing that I was gonna point out was kind of similarly expressed by uh, Director Flynn. I was, just wanting to integrate in the thought about how equity and access to um, the benefits of having you know more dollars going towards affordable housing and improvements in these areas um, play out for you know where we have communities in need and the potential for displacement. Um, in Westminster, we actually don't have an ADU <laughs> policy. I would love to see us move towards that. And I think having educational information, particularly around what's the impact to infrastructure and how can we actually um, successfully get ADUs built. Um, but at the same time, in a lot of our areas where I could see these really helping people, I think the, the question of displacement does come up. So. Um, that extra layering of equity into the parameters for any of the, the dollars that are associated with these would be something I would hope we'd have and also maybe integrate into that strategic growth. Yeah, and I, just my fault for not like having displacement and equity on the slide deck because that in okay. our more full version that we'll be going over with everyone, it's very prominently highlighted and a very uh, key part of it. So that's... Hmm. But I just want to say that to say it is yeah, extremely you. critical to the approach and uh, we should have had it on the deck. Awesome, All right. thank you. Thank you. Director Levy? Yeah, thanks. Um, I must just start by appreciating that that you've um, come um, to join us this, this afternoon with this budget proposal. Um, and, and just, you know, you, you already know this, but I'm just going to say it again, that we, the, the, the folks you see here in this meeting on this screen, um, although we're all in Dr. Cog, we're all in the Denver metropolitan area, there's incredible diversity um, among our communities in terms of size, in terms of future needs, in terms of the, the age and diversity, both economic and racial and, and ethnic diversity of our communities. And, and you're going to get the best input you need from this group here, and I and so appreciate you coming to us, and hope you'll do it again and again. Um, I also just wanted to to thank you for some of the things that are not Dr. Cog related that are in the uh, the budget proposal, um, eliminating the budget stabilization factor. Um, that that's a remarkable achievement. Um, the funding for high acuity youth. 
of the uh yeah the, you know and there's a lot of that and um and so this it's a really really inspiring budget and i really appreciate it um you know we'll get into a lot of the details of these proposals as they get fleshed out in bills um and but overall i i share what um my fellow board members are saying about liking the direction that you're going the specific question i have is whether we will see um, in some other forms um, some additional um, financial support for transit it, beyond the fare free for better air program um, because i think one of the things that was really most missing last year um, was the fact that you know what we we want we want to build these transit oriented communities we recognize the value of them for a whole host of reasons um, but but our ability to actually capitalize on the planning we're doing, and although I'm a Boulder County Commissioner, I live in and have been politically uh, active in the city of Boulder for years, and we have a transit junction, a, 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 a transit-oriented area that currently does not have transit. So getting, and, and it's not because RTD um, is, you know, it has fallen short. It, they don't have the funds. So I'd love just to hear you know, what you're thinking about in terms of supporting the transit to go along with all the great planning that I think most of us here in Dr. Cog really want to do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Jared. <laughs> uh, I, I was just going to say, I mean, that's one of the other things we heard loud and clear last year, right? I think um, that was one of the kind of top themes, I think, in almost every conversation that we had. Uh, and so, um, Eleni, I know you can speak to it. And John, also sitting across from me, um, can speak to it. So, yeah, I, I, John can jump in with more details. But I mean, I think, Commissioner, you're absolutely right. You can't have the TOD without reliable transit. And I think beyond what was in the governor's budget that was released today on free fare, um, I think given the fact that Senator Winter and Representative Lynn said are working on that larger RTD transit focus bill, I think a top priority is. How can we have more creative levers to create a more sustainable revenue source for transit beyond just 260? 260 was a step in the right direction, but of course it's not enough. There's not enough money for operations. So that's definitely going to be a big part of the 2024 session. And I think as much as that operationalizes into legislation, we want to make sure it's obviously complementary with all of these goals as well, um, along with RTD reform in general. And I don't know, John, if you have more to, to add there, but. Yeah, no, I was just going to say the exact same thing is it, you know, that, that's going to be part of the conversation, making sure that RTD can operate as effectively as possible in this to provide the transit necessary and that we are able to identify sustainable funding um, to serve those operations. So at, at this point, I just say expect a lot more conversations around that. Yeah, most thanks. definitely. Well, just thanks for recognizing that Senate Bill 260 isn't the, the end of the, you know, it's not the going to solve. It's not the panacea. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. Director Walton. Hi, everyone. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just start um, by commenting that this feels really refreshing. I haven't been involved in any of the day-to-day -day conversations. I appreciate the opportunity that we had as a Dr. Cog group um, coming right out, uh, having our retreat timed um, right after the session ended and being able to have a robust conversation and then immediately start digging in and taking some action. So I really appreciate um, this organization and those that have been at the table since then, <laughs> having the conversations that have resulted in the presentation that you're sharing with us today. It does absolutely feel refreshing. And um, so I look forward to um, those of you who will continue as I roll off uh, my council role um, here in the next couple of months. I, I just appreciate what, what will continue going forward and, and um, and how I might stay plugged in as a resident of Lafayette, not a city councilor and a director of Dr. Cog. Um, I wanted to appreciate specifically um, what I was hearing from Mr. Hughes regarding aging. Um, it's something that is, um, uh, I've been in my, in my days, waning days in Lafayette, been talking about with my counselors and, um, really trying to figure out what that starts to look like. And so it's, I really want to 
challenge the intersection of our aging population when it comes to the transit-oriented development and the ADUs, because some of the specific things that I see um, is um, the funding piece that Director Levy pointed out. Um, I heard in the presentation the words transit potential. Um, I think that that's something that we're talking a lot about when it comes to the corridor along Highway 7 and Highway 287, where that intersects um, right in the heart of Lafayette. And so where are those opportunities? Because when you look at um, a lot of the attention that's been focused on rail, um, I would like to to focus some of that or see some of those conversations happening so that we can really be enlightened and um, be visionary in what the transit potential and then there hopefully soon can be um, executed in supporting those who will be downsizing, who may be not driving or should not be driving, but then are making decisions that then have access to transit. Um, the other thing when it comes to aging and the housing piece of it and the ADU piece that I see is that it starts to, um, you know, become a, a conversation in communities around density and um, where that might be a pin, pinch point for some, um, density usually means going vertical. And so what I see in my community are a lot of um, homes with stairs and steps. And so as as things go vertical, and as you talk about some of the details, how can, um, how can some of that how can some of this funding be supporting the housing that we're building for 20, 30, 50 years from now um, to really support people aging in place or downsizing sooner and, um, and having those amenities that they don't think they need now, but they will um, in the future. Um, I would also like to see the opportunity for ADUs to have a permanently affordable um, opportunity and some kind of mechanism there. We um, have talked a lot about that um, in Lafayette. And then um, finally, the, um, the opportunity for residents of mobile home parks um, to um, have assistance in maintaining their the affordable the naturally occurring affordable um, product that they that they live in and and um, help protect their community. So those are some of the things that um, as I was listening to the presentation and starting to kind of think about the challenges and some of the details. Those are some of the things that came to mind. Um, I also just want to echo some of the comments that really um, I appreciate the um, the having the. A Metro Vision as a your new coffee table book, uh, but I also do want to kind of echo that um, that that may not always present all of the nuance in the Metro Vision that you know each of our communities may have in a comprehensive plan, for example. So, thank you so much. Thank you, and if I may build one thing on to what Director Walton said, um, maybe some incentivization of universal design standards in building. So a hallway is wide enough to get that wheelchair that you, you don't use today down. Uh, at some point in the future, that that may be useful too, especially in some of these uh, 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 transit or oriented communities or ADUs. Um, uh, Director Spear, you're next. Uh, well, Director Shaw and Director Walden, you kind of just hit on what I was going to say. <laughs> I was really just I just had a question about um the incentives that are are is that are being considered for thinking mm -hmm. about accessibility because there is such a shortage of accessible housing as well. And especially when you uh, merge accessible and uh, affordable together. So I was just curious to hear um, if anybody does have some expansions on that uh, from the governor's office at the moment, I would love to hear those. And if not, I can wait for more information. No, I think it's a really good question. And I, I will say with our influx of funding, especially over the last couple of years, with nearly half a billion dollars, I think we really wanted to make a lot of those, you know, funding opportunities flexible to all communities, especially um, making sure that we're enabling ex more accessible units. I know that back in 2019, 
DOLA had put together the strategic housing working group to try to figure out how to increase per unit subsidies to have more um, alpha and, and B type units, in addition to all the other infrastructure costs that are related to making sure that units and, and developments can be accessible. I think building off of that, anything that we do in this space, whether it's encouraging more multifamily around transit, we definitely want to make sure that we have an eye towards equity of, of all sorts. So I, I'm really glad that you brought it up. I will say the third piece too, that we need to make sure is complementary of anything that we're doing in this space is also making sure that the opportunities that are given to us with Proposition 123, right. we can also be pushing that needle in terms of not only the administrative side of implementing that, but the local jurisdictions that are opting in and will have opportunities for the Proposition 123 funding that it can be used um, to promote more accessible units. So I think it's a really a point well taken and one that we need to kind of integrate kind of in a, in a variety of ways on the, the back end with Proposition 123 in these bills and so forth. So I really appreciate that comment. And I think maybe one of the only other points I've put on there is I think we've, we've tried to be relatively intentional about, you know, making sure we're including um, our AARPs as well as our Colorado Cross Disability Coalition in these conversations, because um, to your point, and I, I also really appreciate you kind of highlighting that. I mean, that's very much where kind of my heart and background is in a lot of this work. So um, really love that being elevated. And I think as we go through kind of obviously through the stakeholding process, these are the types of things that we'd love for folks to be elevating and kind of um, focusing on. So much more to come there, but um, it's certainly something that is on our minds. Thank you. Uh, Director Ward. Uh, thank you. Um, one of the things that when I went, was hearing when, uh, when you were giving the presentation was this relationship between, you know, increased amount of jobs corresponds with an increased amount of housing. And that reminded me that, at least for the city and county of Broomfield, and I won't speak to other cities and counties, um, we rely quite heavily on commercial real estate to offset our um, revenue expenses for residential because our residential does not bring in enough money. I think our residential probably brings, at least from property taxes, probably brings in seventeen, eighteen hundred dollars uh, per household, where we have an expense per household of about thirty five hundred. Um, and so I, I would encourage the governor's office to be mindful of how do we fix that situation and incorporate that into these plans so that way we don't have this continuous uh, continuous cycle of bringing in more commercial to support our residential and then needing more residential to support that the commercial the, the jobs we're bringing in um, so that was really the only thing I wanted to to say on this so thank you thank you director Dyack. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I, I appreciate the uh, the guests being here. As you uh, can probably tell, we're a, we're a very passionate and and diverse group. Um, we've had discussions on uh, the the previous bill, um, and we were very um, very thoughtful. I thought with our with our discussion, um, we we have a incredibly uh, great staff who who convenes these these types of discussions for us. Um, as you noted, we're in the middle of a regional um, housing strategy. Um, you know, I appreciate Metro Vision being uh, held in high regard. Um, I would just sort of like to, again, more formally offer offer our our staff or whatever we can do to uh, help facilitate this. I, I greatly believe uh, the voice of Dr. Cog, um, the, the the collective voice, um, is is very profound and very strong. Um, although, as Director Levy indicates, we're we're very diverse. Um, good things come out of this this group um, when when we have the ability to to discuss. So, um, if there's if there's a need, I, I know that the governor came to us with an RTD accountability report in 2020. So he's um, you know he's reached out to us and, and used us, Dr. Cog, uh, to try to create um, um, a a thought process. But if you need additional um, additional things, additional research, or or you're trying to to flesh out things, please feel free to engage our staff. We are more than willing to 
uh, have those uh, great discussions. I think we um, we've gotten used to those, and um, you know, I, I I hope to have a few more of those with this collective group. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Director X. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chairman, very much. And and Eleni, Jared, John, Nate, just on behalf of all the board, and you've heard the the level of appreciation we have for you reaching out this early in the process. It's it's uh it's a it's it's a true joy to be honest, to be able to have these level of conversations before we head into the session. So thank you very much. I do also want to uh, appreciate your acknowledgement of urban centers and the role that they potentially could play. And helping us getting over the hump with regards to, to housing. I will say that um, where we probably see our urban centers a little differently than the transit-oriented communities is that it doesn't necessarily have to have a transit tie, right? From from our perspective, you know, we I think uh, Director Normella mentioned just you know uh, the diversity of those urban centers throughout our region. But I think what we see, and I know you all agree with this, it's 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 about you know efficient use of transportation, right? It's about higher density, mixed use developments that are more walkable, active transportation is involved, those types of things. And I know you all get that. It's just, you know, the terminology is just a little bit different than ours. Um, from the board's perspective, let me tell you, I know we have um, we have board members on this call of, uh, of uh, various length of time serving on Dr. Cog and the, the whole concept of urban centers is probably not familiar to some of you all. Um, you'll be getting a full briefing here in, in the coming months about urban centers so we can, so we all are on the, kind of the same foundation as we go forth on this. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, I will say just again, not to, uh, okay, I will belabor the whole urban center concept that, you know, from our planning perspective and in, in the Metro Vision plan, the success of this region is really being driven in large part by the success of those urban centers. Um, being able because, you know, one of our goals is, you know, 50, I think it's someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's 50 percent of new housing and new pot and new, um, um, you know, new new employment. And I'll just say new employment because I, I also think it's population would no, I can't be right. New employment would be within the urban centers themselves. Right. So it's uh, it's it's a legit priority for our region as far as a long range plan. And we're willing to talk to you all about this at nauseum for sure. But uh, again, personally, I want to thank you so much for the open line of communication that we've had throughout 213 and beyond all throughout the summer and into the fall. And I know it will continue. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the feeling is 100% mutual. Um, I think we think so highly of kind of you all and the staff that you have and kind of the resource and I think uh, um, I can't remember who it was. Maybe the chair, but um, referred to you as a, a library, um, and uh, I, I, I certainly um, echo that. So uh, it's very mutual. Thank you. Um, and like I said, this is this is the first conversation. Um, many more to come, and I think we look forward to all that. And I will just say, just getting into the nitty gritty like policy details, I do think an opportunity that we do have with some of the bill language a lot earlier, starting this process a lot earlier is really digging in, not only just from the policy perspective, but even from that technical piece. So definitely want to make sure that you all are partners in, in that drafting work as well. We appreciate that very, very much. We truly do. Thanks for being here. Uh, Executive Director Rex. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Just one more thing, because Eleni, I think, mentioned it right at the end. If there are key concepts that we sh you should at least kind of broach going in, you know, keep it on the front burner. Um, I, I think, you know, we're at least interested in some of the conversations around the the, the corridors piece of this. Most notably, um, I know Eleni was at the, the uh, presentation that Peter Calthorpe from HDR gave about uh, redevelopment around uh, in commercial corridors and the opportunity that that provides for, for housing and uh, lower displacements as a result. Um, so I'm, we're very interested in that. Um, and if there's opportunity to explore that more in our region, I think that's what that's something we'd have interest in. Yeah, and I, not to, I just wanted to also point out that Commissioner Levy and I have had conversations and I think part of what I was saying earlier too is what markers could we put down in some of these bills in 24 that could maybe long range plan for something um, like the corridors piece. Um, I think we're also really interested in that, but know that there, there needs to be a lot more analysis done in terms of like the far 
stretch it and the geography of all of that, but but definitely want to keep in mind what are some things that we could also just include in legislation in 24 or resources r- rather that could get us maybe to that longer vision of, of having something similar to that corridors concept. Thank you. Great. Well, are there other matters from members? Hearing none. Madam Chair. Ah, uh, yes. Um, me again. I, I'm sorry. Okay. I just, I, I thought I, um, I would just share with the board the news that we received. Um, actually, uh, Chair Shaw shared this with uh, the executive committee earlier today. Um, former Douglas County Commissioner and Dr. Cog, long serving Dr. Cog board member Roger Partridge passed away over uh, this past weekend on Sunday. So in case you hadn't heard that, I just wanted to make sure you were aware and and uh, just keep your thoughts with his family and himself. So thank you very much for the opportunity to say that. Absolutely. Thank you for mentioning it. Um, our next board work session is scheduled for December 6th. And of course, our next board meeting is in person on November 15th. So I look forward to seeing you there. It is 525 and we are adjourned. Thank you very much for this discussion.